right, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to episode 79 here on Hawaii Football Now. I'm hearing 80, almost there. Uh, big mahalo to Spectrum Mobile and Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union for sponsoring our pod. Still going. We record this uh, about 10.30 a.m. on Wednesday, March 1st. We're already into March, crazy enough. Seth released this on Thursday, March 2nd, as we usually do midday on Thursdays. Jordan Helley. Hunter Hughes with you here on another edition of HF. And coming up in just a little bit, we'll talk story with our guy, Christian Shimabuku of KHON2. <clears throat> Covers a lot of their stuff on the digital media side. Uh, he was there at Aloha Stadium over the weekend and <clears throat> get into everything uh, going on with the program, as well as a lot of uh, the conversation circling around old Aloha Stadium, maybe new Aloha Stadium. A lot of fun conversation there. All right, uh, quick opening drive. Uh, well, again, we wanted to welcome Christian to the show, uh, but we want to start out by sending our aloha to the family of uh, Gaylord Carrera. Uh, many fans will remember Gaylord, uh, many fans of a certain age, uh, when he was with the football program in the 80s and the 90s, patrolling the sidelines at games. Uh, sadly, Gaylord passed away this past Saturday at the age of 60 at his home in Nanakuli. Uh, 2016, I think folks will remember he returned during the Rolo era for a game, his iconic, right, grabbing the tee, rolling off the field, kind of winding everybody up in the crowd. And, um, you know, just uh, a life well lived. The, the, the guy had helped out at, at a couple of different high school programs as well uh, out at Nanakuli, I believe, most recently. And, uh, you know, we just we've spent a lot of time remembering and celebrating lives uh, of late uh, of multiple individuals that have. You know, it's made huge impacts on the program, UH football, sports in general, right? Jim Leahy, uh, Coach Greg McMack, and now Gaylord Heck will be uh, kind of doing a little post-mortem on Aloha Stadium uh, later on in today's episode. Uh, so a lot of bittersweet, uh, but uh, a guy that, you know, you 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 heard a lot from players of those, uh, of those eras, especially during the Bob Wagner years, uh, that just loved the dude, loved Gaylord. Uh, and I think Hawaii football fans will remember him. And he was he was one of the special aspects of the program uh, and a guy that will live on uh, well beyond his years. Uh, were you on the team in that uh, 2016? Yeah. You were, right? When, when he came Rolo, back for the game. Rolo brought him back, man. Man, um, that was that was one thing Rolo. I mean, not just one thing, but one of the things that Rolo did, right, was kind of bridging back to, to past eras. And I remember I remember when they, they got Gaylord back for a game. That was it was chicken skin, man. No, oh, and he would uh, he would come to practice. Um, I I really do feel that the um, the greater public did not get to see that side of Coach Rolovich, um, not just with Gaylord, but uh, th- there's another um, uh, special needs uh, brother that's close to our program uh, that kind of hangs out uh, on lower campus, and uh, he was welcome to all of our meetings and would hang out uh, at. In, inside of our our team meetings and as long as um he you know kept it down uh he was allowed it in our meetings man it was awesome and you know it, more specifically to to Gaylord he was so fun um man he he would critique our throws he would let us know when uh they weren't up to par and then Rolo of course would kind of echo that sentiment and go hey Gaylord doesn't approve. You better, uh, you better get your stuff together. Um, you know, at um, in the games, you know, he would crank up the crowd and and get everybody, uh, you know, yelling who, who, and it was just, it was fun. It was, he wasn't just a volunteer uh, to us. He was um, a part of the team, and um, our good friend John Veneri uh, posted mm-hmm. a really sweet sentiment on his social media about that, and. Uh, I wanted to kind of bring this up, Jordan. I'm quoting from from John's Instagram right here, and he mentioned that he lived way past the average age of someone with his condition. And for those listening, um, Gaylord had Down syndrome, lived way past uh, anyone with uh, someone with his condition. And I know it was because for years and years, he spent most of his time with the teams that he served. He was one of us in so many ways, and I'll remember him for the rest of my life. And I think that's worth mentioning that um, joy and fulfillment and purpose in whatever you do um, really can play a a mystical and supernatural role in um, 
bringing longer life, I think, to you. And he touched us, man. Like I'm even kind of getting emotional a little bit right now. Like it, uh, guys like that is uh, why, you know, it, it's the joy of getting to represent mm-hmm. something and being on a team where guys like that feel special and, and welcome. And it's uh, that's one of the the great privileges of, of being an athlete is, is getting to um, create those spaces for guys like Gaylord. And um, in turn, it, you know, he, he gave so much back as well. So uh, definitely going to be missed big man. I, I hope you're, you're resting easy. Yeah. It's really well put, right. Being part of uh, something bigger and, and Gaylord yeah. was, was that. And, and I think, you know, as, as you point out the joy he brought to people that, that he, uh, he touched and interacted with will, will definitely be, uh, his long lasting legacy. So uh, again, our aloha out uh, to the family of, of Gaylord Carrera and uh, rest in love, uh, big guy. Uh, what, what an awesome, what an awesome time. And uh, really, I think one of the special parts of the university of Hawaii football program. All right. Uh, we got Christian Shimabuku coming up uh, in the game time. We'll get into a lot of the Aloha stadium talk. We'll talk UH football. I think it's probably our longest um interview that we've ever had uh or guest and, and really it was just sort of like a, a a conversation right uh much different than uh, some of the interview guests that we've had so we'll get to that in just a second but a quick reminder that hawaii football now is brought to you by hawaii usa federal credit union as hawaii's largest credit union they are committed to serving individuals and ba- businesses through its 14 branch locations statewide and convenient digital banking services as a leader in providing support for the islands hawaii usa is committed to strengthening hawaii's financial wellness and sharing successes with members, local businesses, and the greater community. Visit HawaiiUSAFCU.com. All right, game time here on Hawaii Football Now. Nearing episode 80. We're not quite there yet, but uh, happy to welcome for the first time on the pod our good friend from over at KHON2, Christian Shimabuku. Christian, uh, first off, thanks for, for coming on the pod uh, and bothering you. We've uh, we've had sort of informal conversations, the three of us, over... Uh, at certain watering holes, so we figured we'd just make it official and uh, press record and uh, kind of keep the same vibe going. Yeah, thanks so. Thanks again for having me. Um, it's great to be here. Um, feels weird that there's no um, spam and egg sandwiches involved in this convo, but uh, <laughs> or Kieran's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we could we could we could probably make that happen next time. You just get you, if you let us know, we can we can maybe. Whip some up uh, before we hit record. We'll uh, we'll yeah. do that next time because uh, this won't be the last time for sure. Uh, hey man, we wanted to get you on. Uh, you cover basically everything for KHON, uh, particularly on the digital side. You can catch Christian's work there at uh, what is it KHON two dot com. Yeah, do I yeah. got that correct? Or on the app? Yeah, either uh, any, any click uh, is valuable. So <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. There we go. So we got Christian. Um, who was at last week's sort of uh, preliminary preview of the uh, Aloha to Aloha Stadium event. Uh, I assume uh, a fair amount of our listeners hopefully got a chance to go check that out last week, Saturday on February 25th. If you did, feel free to drop us a line in the comments uh, as well. Let us know how that went. Uh, Christian was down there as part of a little bit of, uh, we mentioned, preliminary deal about a week ago uh, on Wednesday last week to kind of check things out and uh christian we just kind of wanted to get your your uh impressions uh it was kind of interesting because i think myself in talking to others who either went or saw the pictures or saw the accounts the news reports whatever it was uh found themselves getting a little more nostalgic i think than than they anticipated uh it elicited some emotions that uh maybe we didn't know were locked deep inside of us uh, for a place that, look, to be honest, has been quite the rust bucket <laughs> in recent years, has been condemned, uh, has left a lot of people frustrated as to how things ended, as to how things are going for the future. Uh, but I think a lot of people taking a trip down memory lane found themselves getting quite uh, a little teary-eyed. Uh, what was your experience? Yeah, it was definitely a nostalgic experience for sure. Um, and yeah, I think the reason why a lot of people feel like that, including myself, is um you know, I think for a lot of people, um, the last time they went to an event at Aloha Stadium, they didn't know that it would be the last time for them. So for me, my last time was the 2019 Hawaii Bowl between Hawaii and BYU. Um, I actually didn't go during the pandemic. Um, I just didn't find it um, worthwhile at the time. 
Um, so yeah, that was my first time in over two years. And yeah, it was a very nostalgic experience. Um, it was very bittersweet as well, knowing that, you know, this would be my last time there probably, you know, in its current state, um, saying goodbye to the place. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's part of it too, is, um, they had such a great setup, um, you know, credit to them, uh, the involvement that old Queen Street Stadium had as well um, also added a, a nice touch to it where they had all this gear and, and all these um, little nuggets that were blast from the past. Like, you know, Cole Brennan's iconic 2007, um, you know, away jersey, um, you know, all these media guides, um, just countless things um, that, yeah, put you back um, in those times. And, you know, how do you think about better days and stuff like that? And then I think the real cherry on top was just being on the field and you know seeing the turf and the 50 seats around you and how grand the place still looks uh from down there but when you're in the press box you kind of fear for your life so i think that evens out a little bit um so yeah i think uh yeah um all of that uh from down there it seems grand but from up there um you know that there needs to be a new one yeah, that that's that's uh, I think puts it well. I think the last time I was there for like it was like an ILH football game fall of of twenty twenty one when when you know nobody was allowed in except the players basically on the field and everybody upstairs and even at that point right eh, it was getting a little dicey but especially when uh, you had like a Kahuku football game in there or something uh, and that press box would start rocking it was uh, a little precarious for sure and I think that was what seemingly was a really cool thing. Um, the fact that everybody could kind of get into the, the, the inner workings of the stadium, whether it was down on the field or down in the tunnels, checking out the Hoy Sports Hall of Fame, checking out a lot of this memorabilia, um, that, uh, was, was provided the locker rooms. Yeah. Because I think for fans, right. That's that, that wasn't a typical game day experience. Uh, there was a lot of folks who spent a lot of time in that parking lot, uh, and, and in the, uh, in the bleachers as well in the stands. Uh, but the, you know, not everybody got to go down on the field and walk around on the turf. Not everybody got to kind of go down into the locker rooms and check that out or, or walk through the tunnels and, and, and see all of the things that are up on the wall. Right. And all those old helmets uh, that are out there, all the old uh, posters for the concerts and things like that. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool that they opened that up to people um, and, and, allowed them to kind of take that in and, and soak that in. Uh, you mentioned like Colt Brennan's iconic away jersey, that white one, right? Like the white and silver uh, with the silver helmet. Uh, well, anything else kind of uh, stand out to you as you, you got to walk around there, Christian? Any any uh, particular items or anything like that? Um, I think uh, another cool wrinkle was um, they had an honorary head coach's locker for Timmy Chang. Um even though he never has been a head coach for a game um, at this Aloha Stadium, he certainly played there um, in high school and college. The only game he actually coached there was as a, a visiting um, assistant coach with Nevada in 2020, uh, where there were no fans. Um, but for him to still get an honorary coach's locker, um, you know, they do it where they put your name up there um, and your hometown. So for him, it had Honolulu. Uh, for Nick Rolovich, it had Parts Unknown, which I think uh, – <laughs> It's pretty funny. It just added to his, uh, I don't know, quirkiness, he would say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, just there were countless things. Uh, I think they did a good job of, um, you know, uh, having every era represented. They even had like Les Murakami memorabilia, which I think was mm. uh, really cool because you do have some of that at um, Les Murakami Stadium. But it's also good reminders to fans of, you um, you know, better days, uh, like ticket stubs from the College World Series in 1980, just to remind people that, you know, that was a thing once, uh, which was really cool. Um, and yeah, please, uh, you had high school teams represented as well, like Kaiser and St. Louis memorabilia. Um, yeah, the whole thing was just really cool. I, I got to ask, did uh, did you partake in kicking a field goal? Because I know that was uh, an option for people down on the the, the turf. Um, I did not, but uh -huh. um, yeah, um, I kind of wish uh, Jason Elam was here to do it, and Aloha Stadium could have a real Elam ending, but uh, it was not to be. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, you you bring up the um, the baseball days of old, and um, Josh and I were talking about that the other day. Just uh, wishing to 
at least see the transformation of the stadium like one time would have been really cool to see um cuz I, I think they even had like one of those um like little models that you could look at at what it used to kind of function as where the the sides of it would completely rotate to create a baseball stadium in there um cuz that was uh a big part of the intention was the versatility of the stadium yeah, for sure. They did have one of those, um, I don't know what you call it, like a uh, one of those um, interactive models or something where you press a button and it, it changes like that. Um, and I think, yeah, I think a lot of people forget about the versatility of the stadium where it used to host baseball games and football games um, until it went into its football only setting. Um, but I think even the non-football fans can remember, you know, the, the great events held there. I think the most recent one that we can I'll remember is the Bruno Mars concert. Bruno. You know, I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't get to go, but I know of many people who, you know, sacrificed their time and their money to, to make sure they want to, that <laughs> thing. And, uh, it looked like, you know, it was worth every penny from, you know, how cool the event was. Um, and it really wasn't that long ago when you think about it, but you know, for, for it to not be able to, uh, be at that specific location anymore. Um, yeah, it's definitely bittersweet. Yeah, and I think part of that bittersweet, and and you mentioned it a couple of times, Christian, you know, uh, a kind of a reminder of better times. <laughs> and just like the this sort of realization or this reality setting in where it's like, man, the the when it was good, it was really good, right? Like when when the football team was was what it was, and yeah. and even well beyond just the like the Colt Brennan years, but right, uh, they didn't draw crowds. Colt didn't like, uh, you know, like the the Dick Tomey, Bob Wagner era. Like those, 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 that was, I think, the peak of of football at, at that stadium, and and just seeing that, and 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 seeing some of the old Pro Bowl uh, pictures and clips, and when the the Pro Bowl was at its peak, and guys, you know, played hard, uh, and guys would come, uh, and that stadium would be sold out every year. Uh, it was it was hard to beat. Uh, some of the old pictures uh you mentioned kaiser right like the 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 1979 or whatever it was the the prep bowl right seeing some of those crowds for like the high school football games seeing some of those crowds for for yni iolani or, or st louis kohuku uh back in the day like man that like why why is it so hard to recapture some of that right and and seeing some of the the baseball memorabilia as you said right and and some of the, the the great teams that played there, whether it was you know the University of Hawaii over the years, maybe not necessarily at Aloha Stadium, but uh, you know playing a major league series, a regular season series there. What was it, Cardinals Padres? Right, that that was a thing that happened. Um, the Hawaii Winter Baseball League and how viable that was for a little bit in the '90s, and then the reboot uh, in a sense. The the Hawaii Islanders. Right, the the AAA squad they they lasted for quite a while, um, and to think that a AAA baseball team could exist in Hawaii now seems like unfathomable. Like it seems like a ridiculous statement to make, uh, and feel like you know you would be laughed off of uh, you know the business proposition table. Um, the concerts that that place used to hold in recent memory, right? A, a concert like Bruno, but I mean like like Michael Jackson, right? Like uh, some of the, the 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 concerts that were put on there. Yeah, you too. Um, yeah. And and it's just it's just kind of amazing that it do, it seems like forever ago. It's really not that long ago. There was this this vitality to the venue to the building. It was state of the art, as you mentioned, with the ability to to move on rails between football and baseball configurations. Uh, and then to see it kind of just uh, meet uh, 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 an unceremonious end. Um, you know, I. I we can get they into here in a little bit. The, Sorry. Yeah. They, they just let it kind of deteriorate. Yeah, just, just sadly, right. Just, yeah. just depressingly uh, deteriorate to the point where you can't even like walk around on the bleachers anymore. Um, and so we can get into the, the future plans here. I know governor green has gone in front of the media here in recent weeks and kind of laid out his, his three part plan uh, for a new Aloha stadium and an Aloha stadium district. But you know, it's like, how do you, how do you recapture? Is it just the matter of building it and they will come uh, feel the dream style, but like recapturing that magic 
you know, and maybe we're looking back through rose colored glasses. But I think if you talk to folks from from those eras who went to the concerts, the football games, the whatever, um, it seems like, you know, how do you how do you sort of recapture all of that? I don't know the answer, uh, but boy, it'd be kind of nice to to have something like that again. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, you, you hit it on the head um, just to have a place where you can do all these things uh, because you can't even do that. Um, like you can't even hold a, a high school football tournament. Um, like uh, there's no stadium for that right now. Um, you can't do that at Ching where there's one and a half locker rooms, like even something as small as that. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, the nickname for Aloha Stadium used to be the gathering place, which I thought was very fitting. Um, and yeah, I, Oahu needs a new gathering place, one that is sustainable and one that is hopefully this time uh, they'll upkeep it. Uh, at a better rate you know we, we were talking about this um marking of the times and i completely agree with that um with that sentiment jordan and you can't help but get maybe a little bit um excited or uh filled with dream and wonder of uh could those days be in front of us uh i feel like having a personality like timmy who in some ways is connected to maybe not all of the glory days, but definitely some of them uh, that were represented in those kind of uh, historic uh, memorabilia and with his Jersey, obviously hanging there and the record and uh, the run and shoot and June Jones, there's a chance for that to kind of return now uh, with what the team has going right now. And I'd love if we kind of, you know, shifted uh, to what you've seen uh, Christian, just the, this spring with the team and uh, what kind of gets you excited about uh, this season with UH football? Yeah, I think um, I remember talking to you and Josh, uh, you know, a few weeks ago when spring ball started. But I think the biggest thing, um, you know, has to be the return of the run and shoot offense. You know, when you mentioned um, the the glory days for the University of Hawaii football team, um, I think those three words will always be associated with um, the best of Hawaii football. And so for them to be going for it um, in 2023, I think, um, you know, I think it's something that should excite a lot of fans. Um, I think it's something that might scare some fans as well, because when you think about it, there's only one coach on the staff that has ran it um, and he hasn't coached it yet. Um, and so, you know, this is his version of it. Um, you know, they're stalling uh, pretty early, right? Because they started spring ball um, in early February. They're, the second team in the country to start spring ball but behind uh, Bowling Green. Um, so hopefully um, for them, uh, you know, it gives them this kind of head start where, um, you know, they they build off of the work. Um, after it ends on Friday, guys like Braden Shager um, can meet with his receivers, um, you know, throughout the spring and the summer. Because I think the biggest key in the run and shoot is, um, yeah, the, the, the quarterback and the guy he's throwing to or the guys he's throwing to, they have to share a brain. And if they don't, uh, it's just not going to work. And uh, these next uh, six months or so, um, you need to build that brain together. Yeah, it's um, it's a transition period for sure. Um, and, and, you know, the, the point of, hey, look, we can get excited about the offense. It is a learning curve for everybody involved, including a lot of these assistant coaches uh working with Timmy on on that side of the football and for this group now and and sort of the future of the program and and this will kind of lead us I think into the conversation about um the new Aloha Stadium but but they know that it's going to be at least like four more years four more seasons um so anybody on this team now likely you know may, maybe there's a gray shirt guy here or there that that Ching's home like that that's that's the home right and so is there a ceiling for the growth of the program while they continue to play in that facility look they're going to upgrade it they're going to expand it a little bit that's part of the reason they're playing or they're they're conducting spring practices early uh, I'm excited to see what that looks like I think the game day atmosphere on campus has a ton of potential I've seen I think we've already seen a bit of that but in your mind is there a bit of a ceiling for this program uh, as long as they sort of exist in the current facility. Yeah, for sure. Because, um, you know, it's not the stadium they intended to to have be their permanent home, right? Um, 
It was a very makeshift operation from the beginning. Um, you know, credit to David Matlin for getting this thing built and, um, you know, allocating resources to where you can have games on this, on this field. Um, but I think part of the, part of the appeal for Timmy Chang taking this job a year ago um, was the potential for him to grow as a coach um, along with the program. And so hopefully, um, or I think the hope for his supporters is um, in the next four years, um, you know, the program will go, will grow gradually with him so that by the time the stadium is around, um, you have everything rolling. You have um, the run and shoot offense rolling um, the program itself um, and its new home in Halava, hopefully. Yeah. It's, it's one of those situations where it, but when I think about our recruiting, how are we pitching it to our guys? How are we cultivating this uh, this dream, this sense of belonging, what what they're coming in and being a part of? And I think that's a um, an ever growing and an ever changing um, story that uh, this coaching staff kind of has to evolve with because that's a big part of. Uh, how you uh, compete at the recruiting level is, is with facilities. And so I'm, uh, I'm curious to kind of see how that evolves. Um, You know, from, from your, your experience, Christian, with what uh, you've been down at at practice, I've seen you down there throughout the spring. Um, What, what do you think is, you know, something that's that's been working uh, with uh, with this coaching staff, with this team. I know we've talked about the run and shoot, uh, maybe some position groups that uh, really gets you excited um, as spring kind of dwindles down. We've only got two uh, two practices left. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think in, in terms of the position group, um, I think the linebacker group, um, you know, there's a lot of depth there. Um, there's guys who were hurt last year, like um, Isaiah Tufanga. Um, you know, the, the initial thought was maybe he wouldn't come back because he was honored, um, at senior day. Um, but I think in his absence, you got to see a guy like Logan Taylor emerge and, you know, become a true dude, um, and a leader. And now you have both of those guys, which I think is uh, very favorable for the defense. And I think it speaks to the defense as a whole. Um, and it's a compliment to the defense that we don't really talk about them very much, um, as the offense is going through this new transition, um, I think we've seen the defense make huge strides um, these past couple of years. Um, last season, we saw them make a huge stride, um, you know, during their bye week. Um, so I think, uh, you know, that side of the ball, um, it's very, uh, things are, things are rolling for them um, in a good way. Um, yeah. I think, you know, defensive backs, uh, you know, they're very deep there as well, where you have guys who are also injured last year, um, like Matangi Thompson and Mackenzie Barnes. I'm coming back and joining guys who stepped up in their absence again, like Peter Manuma. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, it's just a very deep defense or a lot deeper than it was last year. And, um, you know, kind of merging uh, the, the old with the new um, will be a big thing there. Yeah. They recruit a lot of defensive backs. That's for sure. Uh, and uh, it, we, we've, we're kind of uh, big believers in uh, Abe Elamimian on that end uh, here on the podcast. So we're, we're excited uh, for the back end of that defense for sure. All right. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting point by you, Christian, that, um, you know, the, there are limitations uh, to kind of paraphrase and correct me if I'm uh, misquoting you here um, to the fact that, look, that it's going to be a bit of a, a, a period where this program will have to exist on campus, but it does kind of allow it does put a, a it allows for a little bit of a an on, on, on ramp for coach Timmy Chang, who's never been a head coach before, who's kind of growing into it. And it kind of allows him to grow with realistic expectations, maybe before they move into the brand new. Uh, they give him the keys to the brand new car, if you will. Um, and, and I think that's a, a pretty interesting point because I, I, can, I can see that. Right. It kind of he grows as the program grows and hopefully uh, in in you know, in a first uh, four year cycle or something like that there, they've got this thing kind of rolling. And so uh, Governor Josh Green is speaking to the local media last week, um, shared the latest on the Aloha Stadium, uh, three part plan, he calls it. Uh, so the first plan is to demolish the, the existing stadium. Uh, they're going to do that through the request for proposals program, right? At lowest bidder, as long as they can meet all the parameters. Um, that'll cost about 25 to $30 million dollars. 
to go ahead and, and knock that thing down, whether they blow it up, whether they wrecking ball, whatever. I don't know. Uh, but uh, that thing will go away. Uh, and then uh, the second part will be the building of the new stadium through some sort of private partnership, is what he said, um, through a cost of about 350 to $400 million. Uh, so you're already looking at, you know, close to half a billion uh, through the first two portions of that to get the stadium built. Uh, he says that they hope to cut down the timeline a little bit to go through the planning and permitting process uh, for the stadium while the demolition process takes place. Um, and then the third part of it will be the housing and district around the stadium. Uh, so everything that kind of goes adjacent to the stadium uh, on that piece of property out in Halava, uh, when asked about how long before the stadium can open, uh, he says it'll probably be about a four and a half year process. Uh, again, this was last week. So if you're kind of looking at it, all right, that's probably four more football seasons, right? Uh, 23, 24, 25, 26. So maybe 2027 uh, is sounding like the best case scenario for the University of Hawaii to start playing football games in a new Aloha Stadium. I'm sure everybody at home, driving around, listening to this, wherever you do it at work, maybe you got some earbuds in, uh, is probably snickering at the uh, the optimism of, of, of four and a half years because we know how these projects typically take. Um, who knows? Maybe maybe they can get something going. Maybe we should give, uh, give them a little credit. I don't know. Uh, but what do you think of uh, sort of the plan laid out here, Christian? Because at the end of the last administration, there was a whole lot of, hey, are we going to do it? Are we not going to do it? The whole fiasco with the authority and and uh, then every other state agency that had a three to five letter acronym um, was was involved somehow from DAGs to DBED to to everything in between. So what do you think of uh, it seems like Governor Green's got a clear plan to move forward or at least a clear vision. We know who knows how muddled the plan will actually turn out to be. Um, and they're 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 going to do this. Uh, so what, what do you think of. Uh, the likelihood of this thing actually coming to fruition and uh, the timeline of everything. Yeah. I think if you were presented with, um, you know, the two options, one is you get the stadium by the 2027 season, or there's a chance you can get it done earlier um, or later, uh, just depending on how things go, you, you take the 2027 scenario 10 times out of 10, because that'll guarantee that a stadium is built. And um, you know, there's so many challenges um, that, that have come with this. Um, I think to quote Fat Joe, um, yesterday's price is not today's price. Um, I think uh, around a decade ago when there was murmurs of, you know, building a new stadium potentially, um, the price tag was, you know, 350 million to 400 million. Um, and now it's looking closer to the price tag being half a billion, probably more with inflation. Um, and yeah, I think the biggest key is, um, you know, there does have to be a, you know, some politics involved. Um, there needs to be a bipartisan agreement. Um, you know, I think during the last uh, governor's tenure, there were some RFPs that were shot down. Um, so you couldn't really get the ball rolling at all. And we're in this position now where it's 2023 and um, we just said goodbye to Aloha Stadium, um, even though it's been up um, and idle for the past three years basically um so i think uh you know getting the project off the ground is the biggest thing um and yeah if it happens it's it's going to be a miracle um you know it's kind of like having a kid uh you know everyone wants to do it there are a lot of people want to do it but um it takes a miracle uh like just like you guys jordan hunter and jonathan you guys are walking miracles <laughs> Man, that's like the nicest thing any of our guests have ever said. Man. Yeah, no kidding. Wow. We got real deep there. We started off quoting Fat Joe and then we ended up talking about miracles. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you know, uh, in the interest of miracles and dreams, let's just uh, go there for a second because, uh, you know, because we can. Um, Christian, if you had it your way and... Uh, Governor Green, the uh, people in power that that be would just say, Christian, you're in charge. Um, how would you envision this project going? Let, uh, first of all, I want to know when it would get done by. And I want to know, would you go with the, 
uh, the already put out plan of a new entertainment district with hotels and um, entertainment, or would you envision something similar to what we used to have, just a new, um, a new and improved Aloha Stadium? Um, that's the second question. And the third one, would you rename the stadium? I want all three of those things. Um, well, first off, to address the last one, I think Aloha Stadium is the perfect name. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's not many things that are named perfectly, but I think Aloha Stadium is one of them. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, I don't know if I feel comfortable saying like what I would want because I don't know how realistic it is. Like, I think Jor and I would both want you know a seventy five thousand natural grass stadium that can host World Cup matches. Um, yeah, so that's really like in the realm of possibility. Um, yeah, I think uh, it to be realistic. Um, I just want something that's up in 2027 and that we can all go to that can host high school football tournaments. Um, and yeah, it's going to take private uh, public um, partnerships and funding. Um, I think the really interesting part is, um, you know, financially, um, how many seats can they afford? Uh it used to be 30 to 35, but um, with all these rising costs, you might have 20 to 25,000. But I think as long as you have something, right? Um, just my biggest hope, I think, Hunter, is that it's something that gets built um, and is sustainable, where in another 50 years, we're not having, um, you know, our kids reminisce about this stadium and being like, oh, what's the next one going to be? And so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, just something that can be upkept and um yeah and and something that gets built and finalized that's all i want right or i think that's all what we all want and how realistic is that though you know i i think that is in some ways the most frustrating part of this is that even at the highest level at uh at our local government it seems to still be at the dream level um they they, they just talked about in the next 30 to 45 days hoping to reach an agreement on a shared vision not even a shared plan a shared vision so even they agree that they're just in this kind of dreaming oh what what are we gonna do here kind of a situation um is is that a correct read christian because for for us that, that that seems to be kind of the sentiment here is that they're very much in dream mode as well. Yeah, for sure. I think um, right now the the fair assessment is that the next Loja Stadium is a pipe dream just because we haven't seen any, um, we don't have any dates yet for like what day is this thing getting torn down or what day is, um, what day are they breaking ground on the new one? Um, and I think the thing that only adds to the despair is, you know, seeing UH's uh, Mountain West counterparts build stadiums um, that are beautiful and are sustainable. Um, you know, Colorado State Stadium, uh, Snapdragon Stadium for Snapdragon. San Diego State that was built with, um, you know, all kinds of environmentally friendly materials. Allegiant. Yeah, but even even stadiums like Snapdragon um, with other reusable materials, like all those things really can't make their way to Hawaii, so... You know, that adds to the pipe dream. So, yeah, it's, it's just a endless cycle of, I don't know, depression. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Just get something built. Just get something built and, uh, well, they and then they can right. fi- figure yeah. it all out. Yeah, but just I, I like that they've, well, at least in, in Governor Green's plan, the fact that, hey, it's it's get the stadium built first and then build out everything afterward. Right when it comes to the the housing and the entertainment district or whatever it's going to look like, I, I at least appreciate that they're going to you know the, the stadium will be the focal point uh, when it comes down to that because yeah as you point out like we want it done but they've got to do it right they got to figure out what the right threshold is uh, I've always thought you know hey something I've been resigned to the fact something around thirty five thousand maybe that you know includes an upper deck that can be tarped off for for certain games and. And really, it's like a twenty to twenty five thousand seater. But if you know it's a nationally televised game or or somebody bigs in town, you know it's obviously expandable um, to a bigger number for concerts and things like that. But you know, uh, maybe that's a little too unrealistic. But I am with Christian on this. Uh, Aloha Stadium is the perfect name. Like it's, I don't, I don't think you can. 
uh, top that. Um, open to suggestions, but I do think it's just kind of iconic too. Like I feel like if you ask just like a general uh, fan of sports or football or something like that, if you tell them Aloha Stadium, like they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, it's kind of one of those things. So I'm 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 with you there uh, when it comes down to it. Uh, so it kind of sounds like we are taking the over 2027 is that is that the consensus among our little uh our little round table here is anybody is anybody holding their breath like oh 2077 i think that's realistic like 2030 is probably more realistic in my mind yes. um yeah. but uh maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm misreading things maybe you guys are more optimistic than i i don't have a lot of optimism <laughs> in this situation i i think it might even be over 2030 i mean the, the rail is yet to be operational no one is riding on those things yet so, um, hate hate to bring the rail into this, uh, but uh, there will be, you know, the, the other thing here is Josh Green just got elected. And last time I checked, governors only have four-year terms. So, there could be a chance that we might have a whole nother set of leadership um, who will ultimately see this thing out. Because um, from the, the, the comments, it doesn't even seem like they are all that optimistic that this thing is ever <laughs> going to get done um so i don't know christian how about you man are, are are you on the over the under of 2027 yeah 2027 i'll definitely take the over um but yeah i think if it if it gets built um yeah we'll just my nickname for it is um our little miracle like we prayed for this place <laughs> we worked for this place Miracle Dragon Stadium. There's a name. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be yeah, it's a miracle whip. Um, but at the very least, guys, we will have the memories of old Aloha Stadium uh that uh just remind us of of perhaps better days, as Christian pointed out. Uh any final thoughts, Christian, on the state of the stadium or the state of the program? Uh before we kind of uh call it a day here uh and uh book you for your next appearance. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, you know, I know you mentioned Aloha Stadium was the perfect name. I think 50,000 was uh, a pretty awesome uh, capacity as well, because with Hawaii being the 50th state, um, yeah, that's not going to happen uh, in the next stadium. So I think that's going to be a really interesting thing to think about um, is, you know, what's the next seating capacity going to be? Because whatever the number is, there's going to be um, more costs associated with it. Um so I think that's going to be really interesting. Um, I think, uh, you know, to throw on one last UH football thought um, about them running the run and shoot. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's just going to be very interesting that we won't know until August 26th against Vanderbilt what this offense looks like. Um, I think the one thing that, um, you know, that Hunter and I can maybe take away from spring ball, if you agree with me, is, um, you know, Timmy is putting his own, spin on this run and shoot offense, just like how Nick Rolovich did. Um, I think Rolo's spin is he would do some pistol action like he did at uh, Nevada, but an RPO. Now now with Timmy, you're seeing him um intertwine tight ends, which you don't really ever see in the run and shoot, but I think that's his own uh that's his flavor on this offense where you might see two of them at a time. Um which um yeah, but that's the other thing is like there's no spring game. So yeah, it's just it's a great mystery. Um yeah, uh when's the next game going to be built and what is this UH offense going to truly look like? Yeah, it's uh I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Um by 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 the run and shoot in in Timmy Chang's, you know, mastermind. What what does he envision with it? Um since you brought it up, Christian, uh, it, it, we're like everybody else. You mentioned run and shoot, just like catnip. Um, do, what are the realistic expectations for the offense? Because I think people are going to be expecting a lot of points, uh, a lot of points right away. Um, they're excited about the receiver room, I think. Braden Shager seems to be the guy. Well, however, the, the, the wrinkles with the tight ends, things like that. But uh, do you do you have... And maybe it's way too early to tell you, you we can also settle on that but uh do you feel like there are what are the realistic expectations for for this offense yeah i think um 
I think when people think about the run and shoot, they think of like 500 yards or 400 yards and them going vertical every time. But I think the biggest key or the biggest um, biggest way you'll be able to tell if this offense is successful is just if it's flowing. Um, I don't know how else to put it. Like, um, you know, it's Braden Shager, you know, spraying the ball over the yard. Um, and then I think the other thing about the run and shoot um, is it lends itself to a, a very prolific running game as well. Um, the way you can set up the pass for the run, like you've seen with guys like Alex Green and Nate Alawa, and even recently with like Dayton Pruta, um, Fred Holly, guys like that. Um, so yeah, I, root I think, yeah, my thing would it my thing would be um, yeah. it doesn't have to be like 400, 500 yards um, of passing. Um, it can even be very balanced as well. Um, just I think if you. I think the biggest thing is like, yeah, does the offense flow? Um, are they moving the ball consistently? And it doesn't have to be all by pass. Um, are we also, I think an interesting question that our friend Brian McInnes brought up is, is there going to be a shovel pass? Um, we haven't seen that yet, but that was a, a running shoot staple. Um, I remember the the shovel pass had its own Twitter account five years ago. I was kind of looking for it the other day. Couldn't find it, but. Oh, you know, there, it might be available, things, Christian. Because, no, if I'm there's saying, no maybe, if there's no shovel pass, I'm gonna be kind of disappointed. Not gonna lie. Maybe on August 26th, the the account comes back and oh gives us uh, but yeah, whoever is running that just public uh, domain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, well, one thing that I I want to bring up, and I kind of want to do it carefully, just because I truly think this is a diamond in the rough situation, and I don't want to let too much out of the bag for uh, the off chance that one of our um opponent stumbles on our yeah, you know the, Va- the Vanderbilt guys definitely listen to our pod we're big That's in Nashville right. we're big in Tennessee um but uh the person that really intrigued me most this spring was Tylen Hines and we kind of had a, a a wonder a pipe dream towards the end of season when we started to incorporate him in the passing game of what would it look like if he um was used more as a slot and uh, seeing him get reps there, also get reps, obviously, at the running back position. He was a big breakout um, athlete for us this past uh, this past fall. He intrigues me, and I'd love to get your input, uh, Christian, from what you've seen as well, because he offers kind of a Tyreek Hill, Christian McCaffrey kind of flex option for this offense that I haven't necessarily seen incorporated in the run and shoot, where... Um, you could line him up outside, and if his uh, his football IQ is at that level, you could motion him across and then hand him hand him the ball. And th- there's just so many options that a guy like that brings, um, and could really add some versatility and and funness to the run and shoot. Yeah, I think um, you know, watching him, uh, the progress that he's made. And also watching some past iterations of the run and shoot. I think the name that comes to mind is um, Max Borgi. Um, he was uh, Washington State's running back um, when Rolo and, and Stutz and Brian Smith ran their run and shoot offense um, at Washington State. He was their star running back that, um, you know, the, the first year in 2020, they didn't really get to use because he was injured. But in 2021, um, you really got to see them, um, you know, use him um to the best of their ability where, you know, he is getting direct handoffs, but he's also being used on screens. Um, he's also lining up in the slot at times, just a very versatile player. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that's part of your job as a coach is to make the most of what you have and what you have in Tylen Hines is a very versatile player. And so, yeah, I, I'm very um, bullish on him and his abilities and, you know, how it gets used uh, this fall. Yeah, I, I, I'm big on it, man. Get the ball in his hands, however, which way, and and see how that goes. Um, I like that the the flow of the offense, as Christian said, right? Uh, if they look, it looked a little disjointed at times last year. I, I think that was something that the the program recognized internally, and that's why we're seeing some of the the changes Looking that we've seen. Yeah, an identity, something that flows. I, I think that'll be the main thing there. All right, Christian, we've uh, we've kept you quite long here. We appreciate you taking some time. And uh, we'll definitely do this again. We'll uh, we'll maybe get some spam and egg sandwiches fired up um, on the stovetop before uh, before we get you on. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll make sure to uh, compensate you fairly uh, when it comes to that, man. 
Uh, we know you've been working hard. You've been all over the place. You're at UH basketball last weekend. Hopefully you're getting some rest, man. Uh, I know there's a lot of stuff coming up this weekend as well, uh, whether it's starting today or whatever it is uh, on the UH side and some of the high school stuff kicking into gear as well. Uh, big mahalos, man. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, thank you uh, guys for having me. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, spam and egg sandwiches sound good right about now. But uh, There you go. And if, again, if any... If there's actually just to finish the the one request we, we mentioned that Christian we're gonna make him the czar of the Aloha Stadium redevelopment. Uh spam and egg sandwiches on the concession menu, uh deal breaker, if not. Uh so we'll 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 make sure to include that with garlic fries and, and all the other uh favorites from years past. So uh hey amen. Thanks a lot, Christian. And uh we appreciate you sharing uh, a bit of your insight and knowledge. And uh, again, we'll do we'll do this again soon. All right, sounds good. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Chris. Bless you, bro. This is Hawaii Football Now from ESPN Honolulu. All right, second half time here on Hawaii Football Now. Uh, big mahalos to those who have dropped us uh, a line on the comments. As always, uh, our guy Matt V, uh, who said, uh, first out of college, looking to get into the uh, sports media industry, sports reporting. Uh, best of luck there, our guy. Uh, keep keep uh, staying in touch uh, via the comments, dropping your observations as well. Uh, our guy Al from VA chiming in as well. Uh, asked for a Kona Moore update, and we did want to give everybody an update on Kona Moore, the uh, redshirt freshman defensive back for the University of Hawaii. Scary moment at the end of practice last week uh, where he collided with a teammate, was taken to an area hospital via ambulance, his family releasing a statement, the team giving some updates as well. Everything Seems to be uh, in a positive, uh, had full use of extremities. Um, late last week was going through some tests and whatnot. But uh, uh, all the indications, all the reports are uh, positive recovery for Kona. Uh, but never easy when uh, you see a teammate go down like that and, and the, necess- um, the necessity of being taken off in an ambulance. So a uh, scary moment, uh, team called practice uh, at that point for that day. They've since been out uh and uh, getting back to it, but uh, did want to send our best to Kona as well. Yeah, uh, I was actually there whenever uh, the collision happened. It was at the dead end of practice. There might have only been another player or two uh, remaining and kind of a mesh over the middle. And it was, uh, I had my back turned, um, but the collision was loud enough to kind of make me and, um, uh, the uh, the strength coach uh, turn around and um, it it halted practice and I'm glad that he's at least on the up and up. Uh, you you never want an injury to happen in spring, especially a serious one like this where um, you know Coach Timmy couldn't really speak on the situation because it uh, he wasn't sure uh, for for what went down. But uh, thankfully for him, there's. Uh, a lot of off season in front and uh, plenty of time to recuperate and recover. And um, yeah, just uh, thankful that that uh, did not uh, go in a more negative direction. Cause you, you just never know these days. Yeah, no doubt about that. And again, our best to Kona. Um, uh, Alfred V also asking about Joda Chong, uh, the, the Iolani grad who's back home after transferring in from Nevada, never actually played at Nevada, but uh, adds to the quarterback depth. Uh, always good to kind of get some of those bounce back local boys, right? Uh, they're bringing in another one in John Kiavich Sangapolitele via the uh, the freshman recruiting class. Uh, and as we've said many, many times, when you're running the run and shoot, the amount of balls that need to be thrown in practice, uh, you can never have enough quarterbacks. June used to carry like 10 <laughs> uh, in his day, right? Uh, and, and who knows? Who knows? Uh, you know, there, there are quite a few new faces there in spring practice. In the quarterback room. Yeah. Um, I want to speak to a couple of things right there. You know, if he's coming from Nevada, he obviously has a relationship with uh with Coach Timmy. Um, mm-hmm. so that already is invaluable. Uh, you mentioned he's a local boy, played at the Olani. Uh, the opportunity to come and play at home and probably missed home too. Uh winters can get kind of cold up there in Reno. <laughs> um, so there's that motivation. And then I'm not even certain if um uh I don't want to speak too much into his situation, but I'm not even certain if he's even on scholarship. So I don't know if it's necessarily a mm-hmm. recruiting situation, but um, we've talked at length on this show about that open door policy that um, this coaching staff and um, 
quite honestly, June Jones kind of operated in an open door policy that if you wanted to come in and uh, make the team and create a a competitive environment um, or help in the uh, competitive environment creation, uh, the more the merrier. Rolo kind of held the same thing. Um, Whenever I had made the team again, uh, I shared a, a locker in the locker room just to keep as many people around to um, fuel that competitive fire in the uh, the QB room and the rest of the team as well. And uh, I'll be quite honest, man, like even though he didn't play in Nevada, um, of the three quarterbacks that have been added to the roster this spring, his arm impresses me the most. So mm. um, don't count this kid out, man. Uh, plays hard and outside of um, – uh i'm i'm blinking uh is it uh is it is it Dar- darn darling or darnin the uh the kid from Na- navy the mm. uh um outside of him he's the only other quarterback with any kind of um dual threat capabilities so um i like what i see from jonah yeah he's uh, uh dalen morris uh dalen the young morris. man Thank over you. from navy as a um, transfer yeah so uh you know it, it never hurts to to have a little more competition. Never hurts to have the local boy in town uh, or on, on the roster as well. Um, all right, uh, went pretty long with Christian, so a little bit of an abbreviated second half. We'll get into our quick two minute drill to close out a little overtime segment. Uh, did want to make a mention. Um, big uh, big recruiting weekend for the University of Hawaii. Coincidentally, uh, Tyson Ruffins is scheduled to be in town. He's a six foot two, three hundred ten pound interior offensive lineman. He's basically the top unsigned guy in the class of twenty twenty three on the West Coast. Uh, he's a three star recruit. Opted not to sign during the traditional signing period uh, early in February, and then the rest of February basically is a dead period. So he had to wait until March to take his official visit. And, and according to twenty four seven Sports, the big reason he didn't sign is because he hadn't gotten a chance yet to take an official visit to Hawaii. Uh, He has already taken an official visit to Nevada. His final official visit will be this weekend to Hawaii. Played in the Polynesian Bowl, was pretty impressive in the Polynesian Bowl. He's a three-star per 24-7. He's got offers from Georgia Tech, Air Force, Army. Uh, We mentioned Nevada. Uh, He's got offers from a couple of Ivy League schools as well, so dude's smart. Um, And uh, comes from a really, really good program, good pedigree. Um, And... Speaks highly, at least in the article on 24-7 Sports, of Roman Sapolu, uh, who has been the lead recruiter for Hawaii. Um, had a lot of really good things to say about uh, Coach Sapolu and, and their relationship. And, and hopefully that pays off because this would be this would be a pretty nice get. And again, this is a guy who is in the class of 2023. So he would be here for next season um, if indeed he decides to sign with the University of Hawaii. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully it goes well this weekend, the final week of spring practice as well. Yeah, that's that's going to be a tremendous win if we're able to land him. And, you know, even if we don't land him, the fact that we're just in conversation with one of these guys is uh, is awesome. Um, it's part of the ongoing um, social media recruiting game that uh, you kind of have to play that a little bit. The, the big QB recruit that already signed, uh, you know, his NIL deal with Tennessee. Obviously, he's committed yeah. to go there, but still did his visit here at University of Hawaii and kind of we you have to play that game and stay relevant um, with uh, with the young people. Jordan, I can't believe I'm saying that we're, we're already uncles now, <laughs> but um, that that's how you kind of have to do it these days. And uh, I'm stoked that he's at least uh, considering UH because if he's a three star top uh, um top shelf offensive lineman. I'm sure he's got power five looking at him as well. So who knows what can happen? Yeah, let's cross our fingers uh, and and hope things go well on the recruiting visit this weekend. All right, that'll do it for us. Big mahalo to our sponsors, Spectrum Mobile and Hawaii USA Federal Credit Union. Big thanks to Christian Shimabuku for coming on the pod as well. Our guy, Jonathan, on the controls. Fair amount of editing to do, I think, uh, in today's episode. So uh, thanks in advance. Jonathan, and uh, thanks to everybody as well. If you got a chance to go down to Aloha Stadium this past weekend, feel free to share your experience in the comments, and uh, we'll be able to relay that maybe next week on episode 80. All right, for Hunter, I'm Jordan. We'll see you next week on Hawaii Football Now. You've been listening to Hawaii Football Now with Jordan Helley and Hunter Hughes, all from ESPN Honolulu.